All right, well, joining me now at the desk is the Treasurer, Jim Chalmers, after those growth figures today, 0.2% for the quarter. Thanks so much, Treasurer, for your time. Paul Keating called it a recession we had to have. Is this the slowdown that we had to have? Oh, it's certainly the slowdown that we expected. Uh, our economy is slowing in expected ways, and that's really the inevitable consequence of these rate rises which are in the system. Uh, combined with this global economic uncertainty. So we're not surprised by the figures that we got today. I think they reflect the reality uh, of people under considerable pressure uh, and an economy which is slowing because of that combination of pressures. Are you sort of trying to land this plane? I call it a soft landing. You need to get between that two quarters of negative growth, which impacts on confidence, and an economy that keeps going like that, so inflation does. Well, the Treasury expects our economy to keep growing, but it expects it to grow quite slowly. We've thought that for some time. And the numbers that we got today are consistent with that expectation. Now, we need some perspective here, though, as well. You know, consumption is uh, very flat. Uh, growth is not especially strong. Uh, but those are the things that we expected after these rate rises and what we're seeing in China and with conflicts around the world. Uh, but we need to remember... Uh, that we've got inflation moderating, we've got wages growing, two consecutive quarters of real wages growth, we've got unemployment with a three in front of it, record participation, we've got a surplus, uh, we've got much smaller deficits saving tens of billions of dollars in interest. And so this is why our economic plan has been broadly endorsed by the IMF, the OECD, Fitch Ratings, the RBA Governor and others. Uh, we're making welcome and important progress, particularly in the fight against inflation, but the numbers today do remind us that our economy is slowing and people are under pressure. Do you hope the Reserve Bank sees this and says, OK, enough rate rises now? Well, we've known each other a while now, Andrew, and you know that it's, uh, it's hard to get me to preempt or second guess or predict uh, decisions taken by the independent Reserve Bank. You know, this period that we're talking about was the September quarter. Uh, we've had another rate hike since then mm. and consumption was already flat in that quarter and growth was already relatively soft in that quarter. Uh, they will weigh all of those things up as they contemplate the future trajectory of interest rates. My job is to keep rolling out this cost of living help, keep getting the budget in better nick, keep investing in the supply side of the economy, keep chipping away at competition reform. These are the things that I take responsibility for in this fight against inflation, taking into account all of these economic conditions that we learn more about today. All right, one figure that's up a decent amount's productivity. Mind you, it's been down so badly. That's, I don't know... How much to read into that? What should I read into that? Oh, there were some rays of light in today's figures. I think the, the welcome uptick in productivity was one of them, but we don't get carried away by that. It's one quarter uh, where we've seen some growth. As you rightly identify in your question, uh, productivity growth's been really flat for a really long time now. The 10 years to 2020 were the weakest for productivity growth in 60 years. It'll take us a while to turn this around. We give ourselves the best chance of doing that. Uh, with our energy policy, our technology, our human approach to human capital and the employment white paper. Uh, today's productivity growth number is welcome, uh, but it doesn't mean that the, the, uh, the effort uh, uh, isn't still required to turn this ship around. When it comes to the productivity challenges, has the work from home phenomenon played into any of that? Look, I take a lot of advice about this. This is a contested idea. And really, um, I think in aggregate, people are worried about the impact on productivity of more people working from home. But it depends on the industry. Not everybody has the choice. and Not everybody has the bargaining power in their workplace to determine how frequently they work from home. Some people are more productive from home, others less so in aggregate. Uh, it is a bit concerning, but we've seen this uh, work from home phenomenon for a while now. We're getting lots of analysis, lots of advice on it. Uh, we just need to strike the best balance here. We want uh, particularly families to have the right kind of flexibility when it comes to their work, and we want to make the economy more productive, and we've set out how we intend to do that. All right, let's talk about my FO. Is it going to be a surplus for 24-25 in my FO? No, there won't be a, a surplus in uh, printed for this year in the mid-year budget update. Uh, it will be a much smaller deficit, uh, a much smaller deficit, uh, but we're not yet ready to print uh, a surplus for this year that we're in now. We delivered the first surplus in 15 years last year. We've got the deficits right down, uh, and that's rebuilding our buffers, rebuilding our budget, but it's also saving on debt interest costs, which is a really important part uh, of our budget strategy. So what people can expect to see 
uh, next week in the mid-year budget update, a traditional update, not a mini-budget, not a, a whole raft of new initiatives. But the mid-year budget update will be defined by one thing, and that's responsible economic management, because we know that that responsible economic management is helping us make progress uh, in this fight against inflation. So you've sort of touched on this, but let's get it straight. No new cost of living relief in this MyFo statement. Is that right? I've made it really clear uh, that people shouldn't expect big new initiatives, really, of any But is kind. there anything in there? Is there a little nugget or...? No, we've made it clear that we will consider the budget situation and the economic situation uh, between the mid-year budget update and the budget itself in May. Uh, we've said uh, that we're rolling out this cost of living help right now and it's helping. The ABS says that it is making a difference, getting downward pressure on inflation. That's really important to us. Tens of billions of dollars of help rolling out. Uh, and we will contemplate and consider the economic and budget conditions uh, after the mid-year update but before the budget. But the backbenchers are restless with you on this, aren't they? I talk with them about this all the time. You know, I'm I meet, sure you do. I meet with backbenchers a lot. <laughs> uh, and bilaterally, little groups, bigger groups. Uh, and, and they say, Jim, can't we do a bit more here? This uh, is killing me. Well, first, That's what they say, don't they? Well, two things. They recognise that we are rolling out a heap of cost of living help. Point number one. But point number two, they're being good local members and good senators and reflecting the very real concerns that people have in communities, which we share, about these cost of living pressures. And that's why we're not just acknowledging them, we're acting on them too. Let me ask about... Can you summarise for us the National Cabinet, what, what was achieved today and what it will cost the federal budget? Well, this was, uh, in my view, an absolute triumph today, this na National Cabinet outcome. Uh, I don't know anybody else who could have brokered the kind of progress that we've seen today apart from Anthony Albanese. Uh, I pay tribute to the extraordinary work that he has done uh, brokering this arrangement and I thank genuinely the state and territory leaders and treasurers for the way that we've engaged with each other in a spirit of goodwill. We all represent the same people. We've got very similar objectives. We all want the same outcomes for the people that we jointly represent. And the work that they've done collectively today is incredibly important progress. I pay tribute to Anthony. All right, what's, and I thank but explain everyone it to us. What does it mean? It means the states pick up more of the NDIS bill. It means you give them more money for hospitals. It means you continue the current GST arrangements. Is that right? Well, that, the three main parts of it are the NDIS and health uh, and the GST no worse off arrangements. And what we've recognised here is not just the pressure on their budgets or our budgets, but the pressures on all of our budgets. We want to deliver better health services through hospitals, urgent care clinics, and when it comes to older people in hospitals. Uh, so we've made a way, we've found a way forward there. We want to make sure that we deliver for people in the NDIS system that we believe in uh, and which needs to have a really important future. And so we've found a way to recognise those cost pressures uh, in the NDIS. Uh, and I've been really pleased, frankly, uh, to strike an arrangement uh, with the states and territories on the GST No Worse Off deal. I understand they wanted some clarity. I understand they wanted some certainty. I got the ball rolling at the Treasurer's meeting last week. I, I always knew that there'd be some middle way between what they were proposing and what we were proposing. Uh, and Anthony Albanese has been able to strike that deal today. What this deal means is we all go forward together delivering better services for the people that we jointly represent, and that's our goal. What's not clear from the press conference, and now we're told we have to wait for tomorrow, is what services are coming off the NDIS and going to those so-called foundational supports. Is that autism? Can you tell us what it is? Well, the purpose of today uh, was to ensure that we were working together on the 8% target, growth target, remembering the growth in the NDIS spending will still be quite steep. Uh, but we want to target it at 8%. We need the states to help us do that. That's what today was about. And recognising we've got more work to do on foundational supports. Tomorrow is about releasing uh, and taking people through the recommendations uh, of the review. I don't think that's especially unusual to make sure that we've got the basic funding arrangements right and to let the relevant minister, in this case Bill Shorten, outline the rationale. Is aut some forms of autism out? Oh, I'm not going to preempt I just thought or front run the I work. Knew you were that, going to do uh, that. Bill's All right. What do you think about Mark Dreyfus blowing up today? I think Mark was just reflecting the frustration that the whole parliament feels uh, about the cards that we've been dealt uh, when it comes to the High Court decision. Uh, and uh, it wasn't the government's decision 
uh, to have these people out and about. It was a decision taken by the High Court. It was imposed on us by the High Court. And whether it's a Labor government or if it was a Liberal national government, uh, we have to respond to that. We've been responding to that. We've been working through the Parliament, making progress through the Parliament and another opportunity tonight. And so I think it just reflected uh, the frustration that we all feel uh, about making sure as soon as possible we get the right arrangements in place uh, to respond to a High Court decision that we argued against. Is the government hurting bad politically over this issue? I think the political considerations are secondary. You know, we want to get the right arrangements in place. We want to respond to the High Court. Really, right across the portfolio is what we need to do is to make sure uh, that we're making the right kind of progress, like we did at National Cabinet uh, and like we hopefully will in the Parliament when it comes to preventative detention. We're focused on doing the right thing. The, pol the political cards will fall where they may. You're pretty dependent electorally on what happens with the economy and cost of living next year, aren't you? Oh, I think economy is always front of mind for people, um, for good reason. You know, the people are under pressure right now. We don't just acknowledge that, as I said a moment ago. We're acting on it. Uh, it will be an important part of their considerations. I think it always is. Uh, you'd expect me to say that as a treasurer. I think the economy uh, is at or near the top of everybody's list when they're working out what matters most to them and, and how they make their choices uh, politically. I understand that. Uh, and... Uh, but my main focus really is trying to get the right combination of policies to get us through a difficult period at the same time as we make sure we're setting the country up for the future as well. And just finally, I just wanted to give you the opportunity to say a few words about Peter Murphy after her passing. I think what you're seeing in the parliament today is people trying to assemble the right words to convey to your viewers and others who might not have met her just how wonderful she was. I mean, Peter Murphy was an absolute ripper of a person, an absolute gem. Uh, and she lifted this whole place up and so when we lost her, I think we're all weighed down now by this immense sadness about her passing. She was courageous, she was hilarious, uh, mischievous, uh, she was luminous. Uh, we'll miss her a lot. Treasurer Jim Chalmers, thanks so much for your time. Thanks, Andrew.